Hello, my friends. Hello, my life warriors, wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to the Day In, Day Out podcast. This is episode 45. Uh, today, we had a life coach on, uh, Colin Thompson. Uh, very nice chap. Um, got to say, uh, the conversation we had uh, at the time of the recording, this is a few days after uh, the incident in Minneapolis. So it did get a little bit uh, deep, uh, to say the least, with the subject matter uh, where we were talking about it at one point. But we did t- also talk about his time at Howard uh, University over in America uh, and basically uh, how he's uh, made the transition from the United States uh, to China and basically a number of other things as well. He is a very interesting chap and I'm very privileged to speak to him. Very lucky indeed. But anyway, sit back, enjoy the show and yeah, have a great day. Yeah. Peace. <laughs> ah, hello, my friends. Hello, my life warriors, wherever you are in the world. This is the Day In, Day Out podcast. Ah, this is episode 45. Today, I have the pleasure of having Colin Thompson, our man in China, uh, on today. He is a life coach. He is also the founder of Ojunji Enterprises. My apologies if I mispronounced that. But, uh, yes, he is, how can I say, I have got to say in the world of consultancy, uh, looking through his little like LinkedIn profile, yes, he has done a lot and he has seen a lot. But rather than me going into it, over to you, sir. How are you today? I got to say, man, I am sitting here in my office slash bedroom uh, slash recreation center slash movie theater on a Friday afternoon in Shanghai, man, I must say, based on everything going on this year, I'm doing great. <laughs> like, uh, oh man. That's a, short answer. That's, a, that's a short answer, right? Yeah, no, like this is the whole thing. I'm, I'm sure that answer could be <laughs> vastly more complex because like being in China at this present time, that, mm, you guys have gone through it uh, a bit over this, like over the course of time. So like, yeah. Um, um, like before I get into it, I have to ask, seeing as you are there, you are on the front lines, as they say, what's it been like out in China with the old COVID going around at present? Yeah, well, well, let, me, let me just say, don't get me in trouble. Um, we're not on the front lines. We're here. But yeah. you know, the ones on the front lines are those medical workers, the delivery people, the grocery store clerks, the people mm. who either are forced to work through trying to help others or who can't stop working through the need to keep their job so i am um again i'm in my bedroom man so i'm, I'm sorry i am in my home office so <laughs> <laughs> but go back to your question i mean it, it's, it's very interesting because where we are today in china we're probably now about let me say 15 15 weeks from the initial outbreak Mm. Which means that we've been through, we've been going through this for a long time, and things are, are, are not in a, a new normal. I hope it's a better normal. It's not a better normal, but we're, we're not having to really follow all the, the precautions that are in some other countries. So that's great. The challenge here is that we're sort of waiting for the other foot to fall, and we're also waiting to see what's going to happen back in, in the United States, mm. back in Europe. Once the, once the big thing is once the airports and international flights open back up, what's really going to happen? So I'm doing good. We're doing great here. Uh, we're glad that we got, truthfully, in China, it happened overnight, but everything was sort of recovered very quickly because of the nature of the, the environment here. If, you know, if the, if the powers that be, I'll, I'll do air quotes, the powers that be, if they say, <laughs> we think it's best for you to stay inside, you're staying inside. Everybody's staying inside, right? <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Whereas other countries, and by doing that, it cuts down on the transmission. In mm. other countries, though, if they say, we think, if you feel like it, you should stay inside, they're going to say, look, man, I have my rights, and I want to go outside. So due to that, people, other places are going through it a lot longer. But here, I can say that we are fine. Um, there's still one or two cases popping up. But overall, everything is kind of calming down here. Ah, no, no, no. That's cool. That's cool. No, because like you, like 
you mentioned the new normal. I think that's what um, I think that's what the whole world is kind of like looking at. What is going to be the new normal for the next year, year and a half? Because look, uh, at this present time, like the UK is still technically locked down. They're easing up things in Scotland and they're sort of easing up things slowly but surely. Uh, but when people en masse have to go back to work, when people have to like put their kids into school, because I know there are some parents out there which are like, uh, send my kid into a school, uh, no way. But right. like, how, how can you make a kid socially distant? You might as well just ask someone to jump uh, to the moon right now. It's, <laughs> it's like not only impossible. Right. So it's kind of a strange place to be right now. But yeah. Yes. Um, May I ask, what brought you over to China in the first place? Because all I've got to say is, it, like, going to China is different uh, to many a person. Like, to go there and go, yes, China's my place now. What made you go there? I'll share that story. I want to I make sure we come back to the new normal. We talk about going back to the new normal in this COVID time. And the question is, what is the new normal? Well, we'll come back to that because I do want to give you some, some background yeah. on myself. Um, first of all, thank you for a very good introduction. Um, Colin Thompson, Oli Guy Enterprises, Oli Guy Life Coaching. That's, the, that's how you pronounce that. I haven't met anybody who got it correct the first time, so don't feel... No, <laughs> don't feel, I, I, <laughs> don't feel bad at all. But my story of how I got to China, I'm going to go back a little bit. So I'm a Canadian-born Jamaican, meaning my parents, the family born in Jamaica, uh, mm -hmm. immigrated to Canada at a very, very, I was, I was born in Canada, the youngest of six kids. Everybody else came out in Jamaica. I came out in Canada. In 1980, when I was seven years old, uh, we moved to the U.S. Mm. Um, my dad was an engineer and he wanted, in Jamaica, you, as you know, the, the, the move of the Jamaicans to get a better life is usually two places. They go to the U.K. Mm -hmm. or they go to North America. And in North America, it's Miami, New York City, Canada, Toronto. Mm. So my dad had us in Toronto. And then we moved to the U.S., Louisville, Kentucky, which is not the biggest <laughs> city <laughs> in the world. But, you know, it's a great place, a great place to grow up, yeah. Louisville, Kentucky. And my, my father always instilled in us that we were citizens of the world. And, you know, in the United States, it's very much either you're American or you're not. And we weren't American. So growing up, I always had this thirst to experience life in other countries, in other cultures, uh, especially, especially things how the U.S. is very American-centric, which I loved it, don't get me wrong, but I also want to experience some other, some other cultures. So you know how it is, man. Life, ha life catches up with you. You're working, working, working. You sort of get off track. And I had opportunity after I uh, got my MBA to join a great company, IBM, Mm -hmm. And they had opportunities for me to go abroad for managerial training. So my plan was to join IBM and uh, sort of use them to fuel my international exposure, <laughs> and, which is a great way to do it because it's paid for, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, like this is the thing. One of the things I found when I was like doing sales and I was traveling around Europe, I call it rock star traveling. Uh, basically, you see the venue. You see a hotel, and that's about it. And you see the airport. So you right. go through those three places, and people ask you, uh, oh, yeah, didn't you see this? Or didn't you have this? I, I didn't have time. I went to a meeting, did the meeting, prepped for the next meeting, and, I, yeah, I had to go. It's like, yeah. So I, hopefully you did get to see a lot more than I did when I was going out there. Well, well, I've, well my, my rock star tour is yeah. over 12 years now. Ah. So I've seen a lot of, of, of the country of China. I started in Shenzhen, China, which is uh, in, in the south. Very warm, very, very nice, right beside Hong Kong. So I spent four years there before coming to Shanghai, which is a totally different environment from the southern part of China. So I've seen, I've seen a lot. It's been a very interesting time. Uh, I, I got to say that it's been a roughly life-changing. You know, so many things that happen to us that we call life-changing. <laughs> I would say life-enhancing time, especially because of starting, starting a business here, private business here, mm. getting married here, yeah. having a child here, 
So a lot of life experiences happen, but I wouldn't say it's life changing. I say it's, it's life enhancing. So that's my little story of how I got to China. And um, I, want, I want to make sure I say the right things on air so I can stay in China. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. This is why I like, changed direction on a new normal. I don't want you to get into trouble or anything like this. Hey, wait a well, second. Well, the new normal is, is a very good topic. So, so if we do come back to that, that's yeah. a very safe, good topic. Yeah. Now, with regards to your education, you went to Howard, uh, Howard yes. University. Yes, now, I, like, I have seen Howard in documentaries, but like, I can't, like, I don't, like, do you class it like uh, Oxford or Cambridge? Is it an Ivy League school? Because it's been some time since I've seen that documentary. Right. So I would say for African Americans, for Black Americans, for people of color, mm -hmm. it is the Ivy League school. Uh, it is an HBCU, Historically Black College University. And of course, because I went to Howard, I think it is the, the top school. The other HBCU universities, Morehouse, Hampton, Common mm -hmm. State, uh, Jackson State, they may get mad at me for that, but I think how it is, especially how Howard was established, um, gosh, I want to say a hundred or so years ago, I don't know exactly, but how it was established, and one, one of the first universities where, where free slaves could go to school, mm. and when I was a student there back in the early 90s, Howard was producing the most doctors and engineers, the most African American, the most black, excuse me, doctors and engineers. So a very good school, uh, very much an academic school. I was fortunate enough to go there for my undergraduate degree, I have an MIS degree. Mm. Also fortunate enough to get my double concentration MBA there. So I have an MBA in uh, e-business, also MBA in supply chain management. So Howard has treated me very, very well. And I, I got to add that had it not been for getting a sports scholarship, I probably would not have gotten into Howard because when I was younger, academics was not my, <laughs> not my thing, right? Sports is my thing, but I went on, on a wrestling scholarship and luckily, luckily I, I was able to get the scholarship and keep it over those four years. Ah, so what sports scholarship did you get in with? Wrestling. Ah, <laughs> no, yeah. you see, that's the word, like wrestling, when, like, okay, people in the UK, when we hear wrestling, it's all like sort of, yeah, WWE type thing. Like with regards to sort of like Roman Gre Greco wrestling, anything right. like that. No, no, that's not even a thing here. So you had to be like, what weight were you wrestling at? Well, well let me say to, to the vast majority of Americans, it's the same thing. You tell somebody you wrestle, they think of Hulk Hogan. Right? They, they, don't, they, yeah. they don't think the real, the yeah. real wrestling. So I wrestled in, in, in high school. I graduated wrestling 160. Is that right? No, 152. Uh, three years there. Then this is, this is pounds, not, not KG. Yeah. Yeah, that, no, that, no, I got. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was KG. I'll look at you like, going, you like going, what happened yeah, to you? Yeah. Like, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just say, you've changed a lot. <laughs> yeah. So my um uh, my first my first uh, three years at Howard, I wrestled one seventy seven, hundred seventy seven, mm. and then my senior year, I wrestled one ninety. I believe I believe that's that's the case. Yes, one ninety. Um. So again, very fortunate that we were. I was able to not just get a partial partial scholarship i think it covered books and housing the first year uh but it got me into the door all of my siblings went to howard as well ah. so yeah you know coming from jamaica come from jamaica um and, and um the, the, the parents there want you to go to a very special school just like parents parents in india want their kids to go to the top schools yeah. in the united states same thing with chinese parents so when we talk about going to university in, in, in the United States, it was really more, what is a top school? And luckily my sisters uh, were more bookworms. Yeah. Very, very, so they had the straight A's and they set, that, they set that precedent by getting into Howard. And once they were there, and you gotta understand, Howard is in Washington, D.C. Louisville, Kentucky, Washington, D.C. is very different in that in Louisville, Kentucky, you may be one black guy in the room, 
Whereas in Washington, D.C., it's Chocolate City. So <laughs> it was kind of going to a shopping mall, everybody's black. Going to environments where black people are doing things. So once you get a taste of that, you want to go back. So mm -hmm. uh, with my sister living there, we go visit, fall in love with it. And slowly, one by one, one by one, one by one, we started, we started uh, making our way there. Some older two brothers went to Howard as well. Ah, I see. If you were in Washington, D.C., now this might be a long shot, but there was a club in Washington, D.C. called Tracks. I swear it's called Tracks. 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 Like, basically, I don't ask me what part of Washington, D.C. it was in, but all I know is, it was, like, friend went, yes, we're coming here. I was like, okay. Like, uh, security... I Mm -hmm. I know of a gentleman's club. I'll say a gentleman's club called Tracks. Right. Um, like uh, this, look, this was a straightforward club. Like the things, the standout things for me being a Brit over there was okay. Uh, security guards. They were all they were all armed, and then like I believe it was a straight club. But the bartender, like he must have been like a three hundred pound like six foot five oh. black guy, like with, okay. a, like with a t-shirt saying gay and proud. And I was like, um, yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> just like, yes, you are. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And because they couldn't read a British passport, they gave me a tag so I could drink. So right. <laughs> off you go. I was like, thank you very okay, much. Okay. Yeah. Well, I know the track. Let me clarify when I say gentleman's club, mm. that's, that's, a, that's a, as you would say, where you're a proper, a proper way of saying, a strip club. Ah. So I, I know of I know of a track that was a strip club. Uh, wow. That 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 I got to say, um, we, we were thankful that you did not have to be twenty one to get in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very, very that. That's a long time ago. Ah, awesome, awesome. So, like with that, um, college life in Howard. Like, look, you you stayed there, did your degree, did your MBA, uh, like while you're doing your wrestling like it must have been academically a very tough place to be because look um for something which is the equivalent of like okay like black harvard or black yale right. uh it must have been like a challenge each day just to get through all of that well it, it, it very interesting because i i, I think for, for me it wasn't academically difficult the first semester because I wasn't focused on academics the first semester. Mm. I, I, was, I was a freshman in college coming from a very small city. Okay. Going to, going to go, you know, I remember going to Howard my first week and meeting black people from New York City. New York City? You know, <laughs> New York City from California, from Miami. And in Louisville, I met a lot of black people from Louisville. Mm. So it's the first time meeting people from different parts of the country who have different ideas, who dress different, who talk different. I remember, you know, my freshman year, they always talk about my country accent, which I love. Right. So so the first semester, man, you're just meeting new people. And like I said before, we had never been exposed to an all black environment. So being mm. in Howard, very, very high expectations academically. I'll tell you what turned things around my second semester. You know, the women, because Howard has a, probably a, like a, at that time, like a five to one ratio from women to men. And, <laughs> and one thing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 one, thing you learn, one thing you learn very quickly is because, again, most folks, unlike me, got, got their base on academics. You learn very quickly that the women there don't want to date somebody stupid. So oh. <laughs> you really, you really have to uh, raise up your your ability academically, and one of the best ways to do it was to say to a girl, "Do you want to study together, or can you help me learn this?" And so, so, so by doing that, I was able to, you know, have a very healthy GPA when I, by the time I got I got through Howard. But I think Howard, I gotta say, really taught me knowledge of self. Mm. Because we, you know, not this is not a, not a bad comment on Louisville or any small city in the U.S. But a lot of times we don't really learn the true history. Our history books in high school had one paragraph on Black history, and we only read that during February, Black History Month. And of course, it was only about Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm. It wasn't until you got to Howard where you really 
learned about the black diaspora, about all these black historians, all these people who really changed, changed the trajectory, trajectory of black people. And you get very, very proud, very, very proud. And my freshman year was a year of the Rodney King rise. Oh, okay, yes. Right. So I remember on campus, the campus just really being very, very uh, conscious and proactive that year. So it, for me, it was not just academic, it was also really figuring out as a black person in the US, what my place is, or what my place could be, and learning that our, our ancestors, whether you're from Jamaica, Africa, the US, our ancestors all paid the price for us to have opportunity and how it really taught us about responsibility to make sure that we make, to make sure that we're actually doing something um, mm. after we graduate. So um, it taught us to be very, very conscious, but it, it was a fun time, man. How it was, as you can imagine, it, it was a, it was a, it was a very fun time. I would say that. <laughs> <laughs> I will not delve into it any deeper just in case I get you in trouble with your <laughs> community. But like, yeah, I can imagine um, just basically like getting, like getting a rich history of what uh, the black community have done in the United States. It, it's one thing and like, you know what I mean? It's a very powerful thing, but actually getting the sort of point of view uh, from black people throughout the whole of the United States, also from most probably other countries, which actually like showed up there. Because what I what you tend to find, I've, I, wherever you are, whichever country you're in, you have this sort of fixed point of like point of view from that particular part of the gun, like the world, the country, and you don't really sort of like go, okay, what's that person thinking? And they see things quite similarly sometimes or completely differently to what you might be thinking so being able to get that sort of knowledge pull that together yeah it's great and especially with in an environment where it is very intellectually strong which i don't think people get an opportunity to put themselves into that uh, place of discomfort enough these days to do that right right it's very interesting you mentioned that because as i mentioned we came from canada Mm. It's the United States. So coming from Canada, being in an environment that I think was more culturally diverse, culturally diverse in skin tone and in freedom of thought. Mm. And then going to the US, my father used to always, you know, it's gonna sound very, very bad, but if you talk to any of your, your contemporaries from Africa, from UK, from, from outside the US who moved to the US, mm. one of the first things they question is why black people haven't done more. Because if you've made it from Jamaica to the U.S. or Africa to the U.S., you've had to really bust your ass. You've, you've really had to work hard to get there. When you get there, you're going to take advantage of every opportunity. So when we moved there, my parents always told us, don't get caught up and feel sorry for yourself. Work harder, work harder, work harder. Mm. Don't fall into the same trap a lot of African Americans fell into. Now, my parents were traditional Jamaicans who didn't understand the history of African Americans in the U.S., so mm. so there are very there are obvious reasons why Black people in the U.S. are still trying to be an equal part of the country. And I say all this to say our mentality was a little bit different. And one thing Howard did it introduced me to other Black people that had a, that had a similar thought process that we did, but were from the U.S. Mm. I got tapped into just thinking that all black people had the same mentality that black people in Louisville had, which was fine, but I did not have. Colin? Oh no. Oh, I lost you for a moment, but you're back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, what? <laughs> I was just like, whoa, whoa. Uh, you, were say, you were saying um, like black people for Louisville, like, in that same mindset right right so it's so a long story short i think howard showed me that there are a lot of different ways of thinking amongst black people mm. in the u.s and I, again I, I can't i can't give props to not just howard but how how black people in the u.s have really have really taken advantage of the opportunities that our ancestors have, have brought towards us. And I'm trying to watch, but I'm, you know, I'm, you know, there are things taking place in the US right now. I'm trying to clear out of my, clear out of my mind because it's, um, 
I'm, I'm just very proud of, of where we are as a as a race in the, in the U.S. right now. Yeah, like this is the thing. I would say with like, I think the problem is at this present time there is not enough like sort of emphasis on the positive which goes on amongst like the like, black community over in the states and basically like I wouldn't say not so much a worldwide thing. I would say here in the UK there needs to be a little bit more of the positive and um, basically people talking like using either YouTube, the internet to get that story out, using podcasts as well, uh, would be a great way to sort of get that sort of message out. Because like for yourself, uh, someone who's like graduated twice from like Howard, like basically like, yeah, you've gone into the corporate world where you've been working in IBM and like, you know what I mean? You've done a number of courses like um, Agile, like, Agile, um, Sigma became a Sigma black belt. Six Sigma, yes. Yeah, Six Sigma, excuse me. But like the whole thing is, I don't think there is that emphasis. And when you hear about, when you hear a sort of like prominent story, more times than not, it's what's happened over the last, well, over the last few days with regards to that poor chap who ended up being right. nailed on. Um, and you like kind of go right, and you you get that sense of uh, frustration and anger from like the black community in over the United States, and you kind of like go, okay, what can you do to get a different message out? What can you do to sort of help elevate people to see uh, black people in a like different light? You go like if you if we went back in time, like. If you went back to when you were in Howard, the time of like racism and everything like that was a little bit worse than it was today. Go back another 20 years, like back in the, like the 70s, right. it was worse then. Like, damn, there was still segregation in like the United States. Go back right. even further still, you're talking, okay, yes, um, off, the like, off the chain where people could like, yeah, link someone, no problem at all. And you, the further you go back, you can see how bad it was then. It's like, so while you're looking at that and the emphasis is on like, today it's bad. Yes, today it, they're bad things what happened, but it's infinitely better than what it was. How can we, like, how can we make things even better still by help uplifting uh, the community uh, on many different levels? And that's promoting people that is pushing, like, not so much pushing, but if they're willing to go step into the light and be that sort of shining example and go, look, this is a path I made. Right. You can follow that path or you can pick up that shovel over there and make your own. But if you need help and support, it's here, over here. And yeah, take advantage of it. But yeah, yeah. So, so you said a lot, a lot there. Let, let me go back to something you said in the beginning. You know, there are a lot of, you know, my experience, my background, there are so many uh, black people. And I, I use the term black people, not African-American, because I'm not American. I'm black. Mm. So there are so many black people who have all the education, all the experience, who have done great things. But there's a, there's a band called The Roots. I think you heard of The Roots. Yeah. And The Roots had a song. They had a song years ago called False Media. Mm. Right now, if you look at the images that media puts out on black people, it's usually stereotypical and negative. Mm. So it's not so much that black people aren't doing it, because we're doing it big, we're doing it great. However, the narrative in the US is different. What they want to show in the media, what, what they want to put out there is different because they want to make sure that the powers that be stay the powers that be. So I think if you look at what's taking place now, I, I want to say it's it's worse now than it was before. However, in my personal opinion, I think it's the same old, same old, same old. The only difference is over the past five or six years, we're now seeing videos of it. We're not actually mm. seeing seeing things, seeing these these crimes perpetrated against black people. We're not seeing seeing it, but mm. it's not really changing much on a day to day basis. So, you know, the, the frustration right now. In the in the black community, is the same frustration we had 
um, for Trayvon Martin. You know, same frustration we had for Michael Brown and the conversation, the dialogue going on now is when will we arrive at that tipping point? Mm. And I, I don't know, and I hope that we don't, because if we do arrive at a tipping point and, and we sort of fight back as a, as a, as a minority in the U.S., we will not win that battle if it's a physical battle. Mm. We, have to, we have to economically, we have to find different, different ways of doing it. And I think, and this may differ from where people are from culturally, but if you look at African Americans and the black folks in the U.S., since slavery, after 400 years of slavery, and, be, and, and having to accept what happens to you, accept the atrocities of slavery, mm. and then after that, not having, not, not having the ability to vote, not having the ability to change things, what that meant was black folk had to accept a lot of things. Mm. And that became part of our, our DNA, so to speak. So when you see things taking place, before we, we just react a certain way, we'll say, well, just, just hold on, look at it, and sort of move on. Again, you talked about people getting lynched. Back when people were getting lynched, black folk were was, was seeing that, but they couldn't do anything about it. So we had to be much tolerant back, back, back in the day. And I think because that's been part of our DNA, we're still more tolerant. And luckily now, we're starting to be more vocal. And we're starting to protest, again, nonviolently. So I think things are happening, but we have not yet been able to find the means of protest or the means of expression that really leads to any significant change on how Blacks and minorities, people of color, are treated in the U.S. Hmm. So I know, uh, I know you. You're just yes, one guy. I know. Look, hey, look, this is the thing. Like, I'm I'm not surprised. Like, it has gone a little bit deep because look, you uh, you may have been like born like born in Jamaica, went to Canada, like then you like you pretty much raised most like through the most formative right. time in the right. US. Right. Um Absolutely. it's gonna be something which even though like like some people go, you're American, but you you are American, like because just by the words you use, like it's yeah. like it's like it's not like a case of us and them. It's like we and like you yeah. know what I mean. So you like the things which have happened from a dog walking lady in New York to the poor guy who got nailed on, like you and like you know what I mean. There are all these little things which come up and came up over the last few years like yeah um can't have that lady with the whole barbecue thing like right. you know all of these small things which go on like i look, i know you're now a, a chap in china like forging his way um but what would you say would be a key thing to real to sort of like maybe turn that sh excuse me to turn that ship around like to like make things better yeah, well, let me let me first say that you're you're right. I grew up in the U.S. I'm, I'm born in Canada. I grew up in the U.S. and mm. I love I love the United States. Uh, I love the United States because of the people there, the culture there, and it is one of the freest countries in, in the world. Mm. The question you asked me, what would really turn things? I, I must say I'm hesitant to answer because I think about leaders that we used to have, uh, such as Dr. King, such mm. as Malcolm X, leaders that we still have. Well, such as uh, 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 Farrakhan, and that's where the list stops. I think for things to turn around, we need to have real leaders, real leaders in the black community, not even in, in the black community, real leaders at the top of the black community mm. on a nationwide level. Right now, we have, you know, if you tell me that LeBron James is our voice of consciousness, I'm going to say, uh, I, I don't think so. I, I think he is a great example. I think he is a great individual. I think he's strong. Mm. I think he's done a lot for our people. And he's a great role model. I, I think he is an excellent role model. But we have to have people who understand the, the structure of the U.S., the governmental structure of the U.S. And not saying he doesn't, but I think his, his, his lane is something different. We didn't have people who have influence um, in, in the government, who grew up in the government, who know how to get things how to rally people and get things done. And that's what we don't have right now. So I think we have to have real leaders in the community. And right now there is a tremendous absence of that. And I think 
I think for some leaders who try now to, to step up, quite frankly, they're more concerned with how many followers they have. Mm-hmm. They're more concerned with not, not being, not saying things that will get the black community really going because they don't want to uh, impact their marketability. So it's very different right now. It, it's very, I, I, so beyond getting real true leaders, I, I don't know how to, I don't know what's going to lead to real change in, in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I think one of the things uh, with the 20th, like the 21st century at this present time, um, I'd say I'm going to go right across the board. Like here in the UK, like with regards to political leadership, it's been, I think over the last 10 years, 20 years, it's been gradually wearing down the quality of people which you look at in like the Houses of Parliament over here just have not been up to standard. And I think it comes down to everyone like coming from a very select pool of individuals. So if someone like comes out of their select pool and they're dealing with something, uh, they're going into a community, say in Manchester, they are quite removed from it all and they have no clue how to sort of connect with those people. So it's leading to this sort of, people will say one thing, in a poll, but they will do something completely different. And from what I've seen over in the States, I think it's going, like, I think it's gone the same way. Like the sort of like leadership over there politically has sort of like gradually been worn down to like something which if you kind of look at a politician today over in the States compared to a politician maybe 20 years ago, it's a different beast and you would like go oh you like going oh where's the like where's the standards right there it's just not good i i don't know what do you uh, like uh, well i'm, I'm gonna be honest with you. The, the the political environment in the u.s was never one that was advantageous to black people Mm-mm. so go back 20 years go back 40 years again you're seeing a lot of what's always been there they'll allow uh, a few black people into the door. Mm. Uh, once they get in there, they're very limited in what they can do. And they also want to make sure they stay there. And as you mentioned, it's sort of like forgetting where you come from. And I'm not implying any any black politician has done that, but we had a lot of politicians who who got into the government during or right after the civil rights movement. And they initially had a lot of good, a lot of good, they, they helped the black people in the US progress a lot. Mm. But a lot of them have retired. A lot of them have, have unfortunately passed away. And now they're being replaced with a different, you know, the majority, the majority of them were Democrats. Now they're being replaced with officials who aren't Democrats. So it's, it's hard to really look to a government. And again, look at what's taking place over the last, <laughs> I want to say 175, 50, 40, mm. 30, 20, 10, 5, you know, four days in the U.S., not much has changed. Mm. And w- w- what we're seeing is, is, is the opposite. More people, I'm going to say the majority, I'll just say it, more Caucasian people are being even bolder now in, in showing how they really feel about things. You brought up the example, the example of the woman in New York who, who called the phone because of the competition in the park with her dog. Mm. Even though she was breaking the rules, she knew consciously that because she is a white woman in the U.S., that and if she she can pick up the phone and call nine one one, and the word she used was the African American here threatening my life. Mm. Now, if that call took place, let's say in the, in the southern part of, of the United States, he may have been shot on the spot. Mm. So, so she knew exactly what words to say to really one either get him to to vacate and leave the area or to make sure when the cops got there, they would protect her before they even got the whole story. Now, luckily he had it on tape and he was a very calm brother, very, mm. very calm. So nothing took place, but, but if you see, if you see, you see this example is happening more often, even in Minnesota, there was a case yesterday of um, a, a gentleman in, a, in, a, in Minnesota in, in one, a building, office building, 
in the same area where, the, where unfortunately, the gentleman um, was, was, was murdered by the police. What you saw was in, in the gym, he was questioning why these three or four black men were in the gym when only business owners of that, lease owners could be in that gym. Mm. And they said, hey, hey, we have a business here. We have a lease here. We, we're renting here. He said, no, which office? He wanted them to provide. This is a regular, so yeah. people are getting much, much, much more bold in, in con con confronting people of color as if they are the, as if they are the militia. Mm. And luckily again, I'm um, not luckily, but in, in both cases, the Central Park woman and in this case, they were, you know, um, Central Park woman lost her job, lost her dog. The gentleman in, in the office building, they canceled his lease. Uh, and all, all, all of this is on phone. So it, it's sort of like the, 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 go back four and a half years ago, you did not see that level of confrontation, especially from uh, a Caucasian person to somebody of color. Mm. But now you're seeing it almost as if that's the responsibility. And it goes right back to Ahmaud Arbery, which took place back in February. It was the two white gentlemen who felt that they needed to be the police, that they needed to do a citizen's arrest and yep. chase the guy down in the street, mm. right, in the street with guns. Yep. He protects himself, gets shot, and then the other guys uh, get off on, on self-defense. So again, confrontation, feeling like they have a right to, to do this. And also feeling like each of these cases, the person felt like the black people were stepping out of their lane, mm. right? You shouldn't be in this gym. You can't tell me to, to leash my dog, even though that's the rules. You shouldn't be jogging in this neighborhood because you may be causing trouble. So yeah. I know I'm going on and on, but it's a very, it's a very frustrating thing, especially I have a, I have a 10, I have a 10 month old baby. And you know, he, so he's a young black man. It's a very terrifying thing knowing that I have to sit him down and, and, and hammer home what he can and can't do when he gets older. And that plane touches down in the US. It's mm. very sobering, very sobering thought about having that conversation. No, and I can imagine, I can imagine. But congratulations on your 10 month oh, Thank you, sir. No worries. Thanks. Like, yes, I'm sure the little bundle of energy is keeping you up at night. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. No, no. No. Uh, yeah. Thank you uh, very much for your insight with that because, yeah, you know what I mean? It's something I think plays on many a person's mind and sometimes it's a case of you want to say stuff but you just feel like you can't say stuff is that what is the right thing to say what is the wrong thing to say and um, like have you like thought sat down and really thought about it rationally or uh, like because there's sometimes where you just see it and like you know what i mean i'm sitting here in the uk and i'm like what the f like, i'm literally i'm lose my work like anger like kicks in and I have to take a breath for a moment and go, okay, let's see what, how everything plays out. And then like, yeah, see all the evidence. And it's like, okay, yeah, yeah. I, I've taken my time. That's just blatantly wrong. What are you going to do about it? And you don't see anything done. So it's like, yeah. Right. You know, had you asked me this question one week ago, two weeks ago, I probably wouldn't go so, so much in, but mm. It goes back to the frustration. And I was having a conversation this morning with another um, African American. African American here. He's from Baltimore, and Baltimore is one of the cities where you have a lot of police abuse. So a lot, not a lot of trust there. And we're talking about the need for a leader in the U.S. And the, the problem is people are not willing to really speak their mind. So you know, I, I have a life coaching business. Life coach is life coach. I'm mm -hmm. open to everybody. Yeah. I know I'm doing, I told him I know I'm doing this interview today and I don't know how much I want to talk about this because I don't want to alienate myself from future clients. And, and, and at the end of the day, I said, look, my clients want authenticity mm. and I'm not going to not speak my mind and share what I think is a very important message because I'm scared of losing business. Mm. This is about life and death. This is literally about life and death and unless something happens once something happens more black people are going to continue to die mm. that's why we have to do something and i don't know what that something is 
And each time this happens, we, what do we say? We say, oh, wow, we must do something. Mm. But nothing really, really is getting done. And, and, and as a community, I, 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 I don't know what has to happen for, for change to really, to really, really take place. And it, it's a very, very scary situation because it seems like it's legal, accepted, or business usual that not just police, but white citizens can abuse, kill, um, confront, and try to, uh, try to uh, belittle people of color. It's, 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 yeah, so, so if I went too, too far into it today, I apologize to you. Oh. But, but this, this is, it's, too, it's, too far, it's too important. And, and maybe, maybe because I went to an HBCU, Historically Black College University, maybe because I went to yeah. Howard, I feel a responsibility to make sure that the people know how I feel. I'm not mm. speaking for all Blacks, but this is how I feel as a Black man who grew up in the United States and who is scared, terrified of, of what could happen to me on any day of the week living in the U.S. Mm. Mm. Like, was that one of the reasons why you like, went to China instead? Uh, was it a case of like, what, what was that driving force? I know, like, yeah. Well, if you, if you ask some of my family members, they'll, they'll mention I had just broken up with my fiance, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to get the get out of get out of um, <laughs> the, uh, distance. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but it goes back to really wanting to to live life abroad. And I'm going to come back to your question. When I first moved to the U.S. from Canada, mm. in Canada we had neighbors who were Indian, white, uh, a lot of different different colors and cultures and hues. And I never felt different. I never felt black. The very moment we moved to the U.S., you you felt black. Don't go to this neighborhood. Don't mm-hmm. do this. Watch out for this. Um, you're going to be viewed. It, it was it was very very different. So I always felt like I always had a different a different experience. And I wanted to see how that experience was really outside of of the United States. I wanted to use my passport. So. Again, I, I made a, a decision and sort of made a conscious effort to, to get my MBA and join an organization that would give me an opportunity to go abroad. So it wasn't that they said, hey, Colin, um, um, here's an opportunity. It was more of during the interview process with every company, what opportunity they have internationally. And I made, I made them very well aware that my intention was to get experience. Now, 18 months after I joined IBM, I, I, I went abroad, luckily. So it wasn't necessarily driven due to my ex fiance and whatnot. So <laughs> I got because I did want to get experience. And quite frankly, I didn't know it was going to be uh, China. But at that point, I was ready to, to try, try any, any culture. You know, let me free in, in a culture. I'll find my way and I'll learn my way. And um, it, it's, been a, it's been a very good experience. But again, my thirst to really understand and increase my cultural, that cultural intelligence is what led me to go abroad. Ah, excellent. And how has China been uh, for you out there? How's it been? It, it, wonderful. It, it's, you, you, earlier we talked about the image that is portrayed of African Americans and Black people in the U.S. Mm-hmm. One of them may not be, 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 one may not be so, so true. Also, when the media portrays Africa, it may not be in the best light. Well, when the media portrays China also, it might not be in the best light. I can tell you, I've had a, a very enjoyable time here, and other foreigners have as well. Now, again, I'm in Shanghai, which is one of the most culturally diverse cities in the world. And what I appreciate the most about living here is I have friends who are French, friends who are Irish, friends who are Indian, from the Caribbean, all over the world, literally all over the world, and we all interact with, with local culture, mm. and we all interact with each other. Whereas in the U.S., you know, I may know a few guys from Africa. I may know a guy who's on who's on um, uh, an internship here who has an English accent, but not so so much. So here, it's very it's very culturally diverse, and they really look at foreigners as people who have a a, a who are bringing value to the country. So they, I, I haven't had too many issues here due to being black 
or being a foreigner. Now, of course, because of COVID, there are some things taking place that that are unfortunate here in China. But my path here in China has been has been one that's been very well. And I gotta say, living in a major city and living in a smaller city in China is different. Of course, when I first moved here, yeah, people coming up to me, touching my skin. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I was back in back in 2008 in some smaller cities. You're literally the first black person I've ever seen face to face. Yeah, so like, I'm very serious. Yeah, no, my like my friend, like one of my best like mates, like he traveled to China maybe about three, four years ago, maybe longer, and like he like he would say he'll be standing around in the street like waiting for someone to come along then like someone would like sort of come in like just behind them like this with the camera uh, yeah and like there'll be someone just like appear they'll take the picture and that person just disappears like, yeah. <laughs> and he, yeah. like he had that about uh four or five times a day he said is that yeah, yeah it's very that. very often <laughs> initially it's very frustrating too because you mm. feel like you're your animal in a cage um, and people are just, you know, looking at you, taking pictures. A strange thing is, a lot of times, guys would come and say, please take a picture of my girlfriend. And I'm like, well, I come from, you can do that. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't do it's like, that. It's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> it, happens, it, happens, it happens a lot. Again, not in Shanghai, because Shanghai and Beijing are very diverse. Yeah. But some of the, some of the smaller cities, where the population is only 10 million, you'll see that, you'll see that happening <laughs> a whole lot more. But the thing is to remember, and it takes time to really get here because you really get frustrated because everywhere you go, sometimes people are looking at you, touching your skin, uh, turning, turning off the direction to, to get away from you. What you learn though is most people here are curious and they're looking mm. at you, taking pictures out of curiosity, not because of, of some, some negative stereotypes. And when I came here, I had I had my I had my radar on, I had my my my, my shield on because of how black people are viewed in the U.S. So I came here, and you you get an elevator, somebody Chinese will look at you in the eye, look at you, stare at you. Yeah. Where I come from, you want to fight. But here, it's curious. So it took a few years actually to get used to that and to understand that here. You know, a lot of Chinese people may think you're poor because you're from Africa. Right. So, you know, it, it took a long, lot of conversation to explain to people how, yes, you can be black and not be from Africa. You can be mm -hmm. black in, in, in England, you can be black in, 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 uh, in the United States, in Canada. They really didn't understand that, even though they watch basketball, you know, I love basketball, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, but they, but they think everybody is from Africa. And we, quite frankly, they're right. We're all, all from Africa, but mm -hmm. they may think you're coming from a poor country, but they don't feel like you're, you're a thug, or you're going to rob them, you're going to give them any harm. So mm -hmm. it's very much a different atmosphere. No, I see, I see. So uh, you went over there with IBM. Uh, what was you, like, what was the main focus of you going over there? Was it for a particular task or what was the reason why IBM went off to China, you go? Well, I like the thing because they wanted to put the top talent in, in the top area. <laughs> he he so says, I, I just adjust <laughs> these costs. <laughs> yeah, yes, the top ta talent. Yes, yeah, look in the mirror. I, yeah, I joined IBM in 2006 yeah. into really, really laying on my, my, um, my supply chain background. So I joined a, a two-year managerial training, like a leadership program, uh, two years, four rotations. My first three rotations were in New York. My final one was in Shenzhen, China, supporting a new uh, business office, business offering. We were doing uh, custom customizations to soft to hardware. You know, I've been uh, manufacturing servers and whatnot. So if you think about Walmart, who may order X amount of IBM servers, mm. what typically will take place is, those servers would be delivered to Walmart and then configured for Walmart. What we were doing, we were doing the configuration first and then shipping it, which meant that Walmart could be, uh, any organization can be up and running a lot faster. Right. So, so I came in as the new manager for that business and it was a, a very interesting, it, it, it was a great, great two, three years doing that. 
then uh, the opportunity to move to Shanghai, Shanghai being the New York City of China, came up to go more into the business transformation side. So I transferred to uh, uh, Shanghai office, and that's where you mentioned earlier, I, I became a, a ways of working consultant, meaning I really learned how to uh, uh, be more into process management. So I became a, 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 a lean six sigma black belt, mm -hmm. and also an agile consultant. So for the next four or five years with IBM, I helped them to, I helped internally help businesses to streamline, reduce waste, and be more efficient with mm -hmm. the same or less resources. But it was very interesting. People, people started getting scared of us because they knew <laughs> that we come in there, we make you more efficient, then somebody, somebody leaving, right? <laughs> it's like, it's like, look how efficient I am. I am working hard. Look, yeah, don't, yeah. <laughs> don't look at me too much, but look at me working hard. That's right, like, okay. right, right, right. Uh, wow. That like basically going in as a consultant doing that type of work is like, it, it's one of those things. I have a couple of friends who are consultants. So it's like one of those things where you go, yeah. From before, if I didn't know them, I just like, oh, yeah, you're in the whole process of just firing people. That, that's it. Uh, that, that plain and simple. And like, you would not be able to convince me any other way. But when you, like, when you look under the hood of an organization or a department and go, wait a second, uh, just simply go through a spreadsheet and go, yeah, you know what? If you just simply did this and did that, right, like, right. people don't need to actually go just one or two things make yourself more efficient and you've like saved yourself four hundred thousand dollars <laughs> right why, <laughs> why don't you do that but you know it's funny because if you if you if you have a department save four hundred thousand dollars next question is why were they so inefficient in the first place let's have a conference with the manager so they're mm. interested how, how how you go in and help but sometimes they don't want the help but as you mentioned consulting can be kind of cold kind of um like, like, like running into a, a brick wall, but IBM also gave me the opportunity to join their agile team. Mm. So we moved from being a traditional um, software development to more agile, which, which is a different way of working. And that's really where I started getting, getting into the coaching. Because as you know, as a consultant, you're being paid to help understand what the problem is and help find solutions. Mm. As a coach, you're being, you, you're, especially corporate coaching, you're more helping employees improve their ability, help mm. teams improve their ability. So it was a much better, more fulfilling means of work. And that really helped me to break from IBM and form my own uh, life coaching business. Like life coaching slash a blockchain because technology, uh, uh, disruptive, technolo te disruptive technologies is sort of my, my hobby. So it gave me a great opportunity to sort of go on my own as well. Mm. And when you say blockchain, like, because like, this is the thing, like, I would say the majority of the world knows blockchain as cryptocurrencies. Yeah. But um, I think that might be sort of simplifying it a little bit, uh, simplifying it. Uh, is there more to blockchain or is it just that? You are correct. That is very much a simplification of, of, of blockchain. Um, cryptocurrencies is, is made possible because of blockchain technologies. Mm. Uh, so when I, when, I, when I think about blockchain, I think more about a larger, more secure process. Uh, it's basically a ledger that's very, 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 very secure. When I think about cryptocurrencies, I think about uh, future potential. I mm -hmm. think about a borderless ways of uh, transaction, transaction changing, uh, way, way of doing business. I, I do believe in cryptocurrencies. I think that we have to educate more people on the difference between blockchain and cryptocurrency because I tell folks, blockchain, all they want to know is, oh, Bitcoin, should I buy? That's mm -hmm. all they want to talk about. But the blockchain is the underlying technology. It's sort of like saying to somebody, you know what, the best hamburgers in the world McDonald's, you know, that's yeah. what hamburgers are about. When, oh, come on, McDonald's is a very good hamburger, but it's such a small portion of the type of hamburgers you can get in the world. Maybe not, not the best analogy, but uh, it was very interesting building a, 
a cryptocurrency um, project because we also have a cryptocurrency project and and maybe it's best for for when you invite me back but there have been some great stories of highway robbery so to speak in the crypto in the crypto space it's like it's like um um no sheriffs to, to be found at all it's the wild west <laughs> it's the wild west that you know if you haven't if you haven't gotten robbed you know if your stage coach hasn't been robbed then you might not be in crypto everybody's had a bad experience and myself and my partner we're trying to change that we actually have a a educational platform where we focus on using AI, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. to help provide assessments, training, and coaching for individuals who are looking to upskill. As, as you know, people are losing their jobs, and the same skills you had two years ago are, are, are not adequate for the jobs of today or tomorrow. So we're looking to really provide a platform where individuals who are currently employed, individuals who are getting out of school can come to our platform, take an assessment, and this assessment will give them a roadmap on what training they, they need, on mm -hmm. roadmap on what coaching they need. Because we focus on two things, hard skills and soft skills. Mm -hmm. Right, so what, if you have a roadmap, then you understand what your gap is. I'm strong in this area, I need more development in this area. And our platform helps people not just identify their gap, but it gives them recommendations on what specific training you need mm. and what coaching you need. And let me say our platform is called Exchange. Yeah. X C H A I N Z dot I O. Yeah. Sorry to take you back for a moment, but what is a hard skill and what is a soft skill? Just for people who don't know. Yeah. Okay. So a hard skill is your classic, I'm going to say technical area. I know how to code in this particular language, I know how to balance my books. Mm -hmm. I know how to, um, I, I'm a surgeon. I know how to do surgery as part of the body. This is something that is, is taught in class where you can study on it. You can, you can, you can really learn. That's a hard, that's a hard skill. Yeah. A soft skill, a soft skill is interpersonal. Do I know how to manage relationships? Mm -hmm. Do I know how to problem solve? Do I know how to help my team to grow? Do I know how to, do I know how to, de-escalate or, or, or de-escalate or bring situations from being somewhere where our team has static to have an ability where everybody's working peacefully and everybody's able to work together as a team. So hard and soft. Soft, I would say, is more the classical textbook. And excuse me, hard, hard is the classical textbook, while soft is more of the interpersonal, interpersonal skills. Mm, mm. so with the roadmap, you can tell them, okay, yeah, rather than say going to university, like maybe you should be going down the professional like qualification route or vice versa, or there might be something else, a little bit more specialist or niche for them right. to go down. So they can have that, um, well, a clearer, a clearer roadmap of where they need to be. Where they it, go. Exactly. Exactly. It provides, it, it provides them with their areas of strength, areas of weakness, and also provides them, based on your intellectual type, personality type, here are maybe some career, career avenues. Now, again, that may be more for people who are younger in their career and still trying to figure out where to go, mm. but also people who've been working for a number of years and want to upskill, want to reskill, based on what you know and really based on what you want to do. Because we don't want to learn people, here are some options that you have. And then, of course, we have a training provided. And now we come back to what? The coaching. We also have coaching. You can be, uh, if you want to be an entrepreneur, uh, small business coaching. We have uh, um, relationship coaching on how do you develop those relationships mm -hmm. that, that, that matter. Um, some people really find it hard to, to manage their finances, right? <laughs> we have financial coaching as well. So a lot of different avenues. But we're trying to make sure that when people come to our platform and they want to increase their skill, it's not just on that hard on that hard skill set is soft skill set, but also life coaching as well, mm -hmm. life skills. So, 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 so we, 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 we believe that this should be what we call a one-stop shop for, for individuals looking to really power themselves with the tools they need for in the 21st century workforce. Mm -hmm. I think with regards to when lockdown world ends, um, and basically like sort of like, touching on what the new normal would be. I think the whole thing with like 
the lockdown situation, I think it's given enough, a number of people a, a lot of time to reflect on what they truly want. Uh, because, like, here's the thing. Like, no one, like, if you said this a year ago, that, yeah, one day, every, like, the whole world will, like, cease. It will literally stop. And you won't be able to go out. You won't be able to do this. You won't, and you list all through the things which lockdown has affected different places around the world. You're going to have people like going, you are crazy. crazy. No way. Uh, like, ah, uh, you know what I mean? That would never happen. Look, so you know what? Someday I'll do this. Uh, one day I'll do that. So you had a lot of people and people say someday, one day, all the time. I think there's going to be a lot more people which are going to be like, you know what? Um, yeah, I'm not happy with my employment situation. I'm not happy with where my life is going. And how do I change that? And like, yeah, providing that sort of roadmap, providing that sort of um, clarity uh, to one's vision, uh, I think it is going to be even more. So it's going to even be more so powerful over the next um, two years because um, won't lie, uh, the recession's coming uh, after this uh, for however long that might be. And when we're out of that, there is going to be great opportunities out there for people. And yeah, getting to them is going to be key. I think maybe with some of your courses and like with like the information you can provide, I think you might be able to help with that clarity for people. Yeah, and really two things, because you, you have a great point. I gotta say, I hope this is the last two years. I hope that we get back to, I keep saying get back to. Mm. I, I'd like us to get to a new normal. Um, so let me give you some background. So back in Jan, around January 23rd of this year, mm. I was in South China with my wife and our, and our baby, and we heard about what took place in Wuhan. Don't forget, China is where the initial outbreak took place. So we were here. And overnight, people went from being normal to wearing masks overnight. Overnight, we, we left to get back to Shanghai because we felt that the airports might close, the city might mm. close down. So it was really a, a high-pressure place the last week of January. Most of my coaching clients at that time uh, gave me a call and said, Colin, I want to put a pause in our coaching right now because I can't focus on uh, 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 a coaching topic because I'm worried about keeping my family safe. Mm. And I totally understood because the last thing on my mind at that time was coaching. Yeah. My mind was, how do I keep my family safe? So that was fine. What took place, though, was very interesting because about two weeks later, the same clients call back. My colleagues call back. My friends called. And they said, Colin, I need some help because we're stuck inside. I'm about to strangle my wife. I'm about to kill my kids. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not being productive at work. I'm going crazy. Uh, I'm getting all this negative news about the. I'm, I'm scared to open my front door. Yeah. What can we do? What can we do? So we, I started really doing more coaching on how people can make it through this COVID time. Mm. Then my family, now we're into maybe mid-February to end of February, and we're getting, I'm getting a lot of emails from family, friends, and folks I haven't talked to since high school, saying, Colin, you're in China. There's this thing called coronavirus, because back in February, it wasn't COVID yet. It yeah. was just coronavirus. What is this thing? Are you and your family safe? So every day I'm doing 20, 30 emails telling people we're safe, we're fine, we're fine. Mm. I said, let me just stop doing emails and post a video telling people, here's what's going on in China, and we're fine. I did that video, and based on that video, a lot of positive feedback, but this group, uh, Buzz360 Media, asked me to produce some videos for the U.S. because now, now we're in almost the end of March. And things are really going hectic in Europe, in the U.S., and people want more information outside of what they're getting on the news. The news is just saying, be scared, be scared, be scared, mm. be scared, be scared, but not really giving you practical tips. So myself and other coaches, what we realized is we had two, two, two things working for us. One, we made it through the initial outbreak period here, so we know how to protect ourselves. We know how to affect ourselves how to keep our families away from the, 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 the virus as coaches we also know how to coach people through this time so we did a 
on, on Facebook, YouTube, we did a series called The COVID Coaches, where for 30 days from April 20, I want to say we're in May now. So from, excuse me, from March, March 29 through April, through May, May 1st, I think it was, we did 30 episodes, one episode every single day, providing tips on how families can make it through this COVID time. It's on, it's on Facebook now and on YouTube. Mm. It was fabulous. And what we learned from this, the tips we were giving, it's not coaching, it's tips, tips of insights. The first few weeks, every message we had was during these COVID times, COVID, COVID, COVID. But the tips we were giving were not about COVID. If you think about your, your classical challenge during this time, couples who are forced to stay home every day inside, yeah. the, the, budding, the budding heads. So what happened was they already had issues in the relationship. COVID just magnifies everything. Um, if you were not able to, if, if you had concerns about your career, now you're working from home, now you're being furloughed, now there may be some, uh, there may be some uh, uh, concern of, of where the job is going to be there down the road. Well, that concern was there before. So all of these things we talked about, relationship management, um, having a purpose, mm. making sure you're working and doing things that have purpose. These are not about COVID, these are about life. So our message toward the end was more about going back to life. So, you know, we talked about the new normal. Don't forget, before COVID, for a lot of us, the normal wasn't the best, the best. Mm. So we don't want to go back, to, we want to go to a new normal. And we coach people now, to find, if, if you're able to really find purpose during this time. You, you mentioned before that when all this is finished, hopefully people can get good jobs. Well, no, 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 no. Right now is when to take action to get that job because everybody and the mother is going for that same job. Right now, while everybody's at home together, this is the perfect time to fix, improve your relationships. Mm -hmm. Right now when you're home, instead of binge watching um, instead of binge watching the Tiger Show, whatever, whatever that is, right? <laughs> right? Or Luther, you know Luther, or, or Luther, right? Yeah. Now is the time to go online, take some training, not from, from, from anywhere. Now the time to upskill. Now the time to really say to yourself, I'm going to have purpose. I have a strong mental mind. Turn the TV off. So, so our coaching now is really more about helping individuals not just make it through the COVID time, but to thrive the COVID time. And we do have a new initiative. I'm going to pause here, right? But I, I, I do want to share another initiative that we do have. Okay. Okay. No, no problem. Um, so with regards to like currently like helping with your mindset during these COVID times, like are you like, what are you doing to help you with that? Are you doing some form of exercise? Are you sort of like, you know what I mean? Um, are you like, reading more? What, how, what are you doing at this present time? Yeah, well, I'm going to go back to when we were going through where you guys are now, because we're at week, we're, we're at week 15, 16, so we've been going through this for a long time, and things yeah. have been kind of sorted to a new normal. So when we were first going through what I call the scary days, the, the biggest thing was, making sure that, again, my family is safe. And my wife is very concerned about our son, mm. which meant that we had to understand how to make sure our house was disease-free. And also, my wife was watching the news every day. So <laughs> no. one of the things we had to do was, was to agree that we're going to limit the amount of information we're taking in about, about COVID. Now, as a family, you know, exercising inside, I was still going outside to run. But um, reading more, I wouldn't say so much more reading more because I was a coach, I was coaching more. Mm -hmm. And the more people that I coached, the more time passed and the more we were, we sort of had our, our regular normal. We weren't going outside as much, which was really worrisome, but we were able to, um, especially for me, I was able to maintain my work and, and spend my free time trying to help other people. Spend my free time taking my own advice. And I, I tell folks, it's the best time in the world to learn how to juggle, to learn some new, new talent. So I was doing the same exact thing and making sure that we had an environment here where if anybody was getting anxious, we can talk about it. Mm. Because, you know, in China, it's very different. Um, you could not, you know, you could not really, people couldn't come to your apartment. 
you had to show IDs to get around um, due to the fact that they must control where you're going, which you have mm-hmm. access to. So it was a very heightened environment outside of the home. But by really having an environment of open communication, if my wife was worried, we talked about it. If, if my wife was mad because I came back inside and didn't, you know, wipe my hands, wash my hands, <laughs> take off my clothes, you know, we talked about it. Um, and we both always try to make sure that we're communicating with our family members, letting them know we're safe. And also for me, being there for our, for our friends and family. So there are a lot of different things that could be done. And if the guys go back and see my videos, they'll see each day we talked about a different aspect of how people can, can thrive through the COVID time. Mm. Mm-hmm. No, no. I see, like, you know, put it this way, like when you mentioned your wife, like, yeah, like coming at you, like, hey, wash your hands, stuff like this. Look, I think she's going to beat any sort of authority, which is like sent out by the Chinese government whatsoever. Right, right. And that was actually a very serious thing because, you know, coming in, my whole view was COVID's out there, we're not going to get sick. And her, her thing was, you're putting us at risk each and every time that you come back in here. And mm. it makes it make, making her feel like I wasn't taking it serious. So I had to quickly, very quickly, to, ch- to change that. And I, I want to add that the, 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 the coaches that um, joined me, we call ourselves the COVID coaches, 30 for 30, 30 days, 30 messages. Mm. We had eight, eight coaches, and each coach had different strengths. One was a relationship coach. We had coaches who were happiness coaches, uh, coaches who are, are our financial coaches, uh, career coaches. So everybody had sort of a different strength. And based off of what we did, at the end of our 30 days, we said to ourselves, okay, we didn't do much coaching. We we're more giving advice, giving tips. What can we now do to really coach? And this brought us to where we are now, which is our 40 for 40, which is uh, recruiting 40 life coaches globally, each, each donating, volunteering one hour per week over four weeks. So now we have 40 hours a week, 40 coaches globally donating that. And now we're giving away absolutely pro bono free coaching. Not coaching where, not a free call where we talk for 30 minutes and I try to sell you a package. No, this is 100% free life coaching, free COVID coaching. And we have now, I think I have about 50 coaches who are available globally. We have coaches in literally uh, Australia, China, Canada, the US, Europe, Africa, South America, coaches who are giving, who are volunteering their time. Because if you look at, you mentioned, you started the call talking about the front line. We're not on the front line. The front line workers are putting the life at risk, but there are, the, the people at home are also feeling a certain way. So we want, we call ourselves the backline workers. So we want to make sure that people are aware that you can get free coaching. And hopefully you'll be able to, to share uh, my, my website link. Uh, www.oligye.com slash COVID coaches. And we'll give, again, we are, we are uh, um, providing 100% absolutely free coaching to everybody, mm-hmm. everybody. We talked about COVID coaching and that's, that's a shell. We know that it's really life coaching. So hopefully uh, more people will, will sign up because we think that, that the, 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 the wrong thing to do now is to stay home and not improve and coaching we all know life coaching helps people improve help them to find um find solutions so hopefully more people will take advantage of the free coaching that we do offer mm. yeah no uh, like yeah um at this time with regards to yes uh the lockdown and basically people's confinement like yes uh the physical, like everyone's sort of concentrated on the physical, and like you know what I mean, like you got to be physically healthy, you got to be physically keep in shape. But I think uh, there has been a huge sort of blind spot when it's come to like basically keeping yourself together, people together mentally, and like with regards to like yeah stuff what. Uh, with regards to like suicides being up and stuff like that, and people who are is- like who are unfortunately isolated by themselves, it's right. like one of those things where we're like human race, like we're not meant to be by ourselves. Mm-hmm. Like you know, what I mean, if like if it's a prison situation, they put people into isolation by right. themselves as a punishment. So like this sort of global thing, it's so much harder. I'm I'm grateful I've got my lady who 
who I live with and that's sort of like yeah as much as she might want to kill me at times and like there's times <laughs> I, I, I look at her, the Chris Rock line comes through and I go yeah CSI they're thorough they're thorough <laughs> <laughs> so, so, mm, so yeah uh yeah but yeah if we weren't here for each other I think yeah it'd be infinitely more worse and like yeah any sort of thing you can do to help with people's mental state bringing them to a positive light uh yeah I think that'd be that that's priceless to say the least absolutely priceless mm-hmm. right. Mm, like, but it's not. I'm sorry. It definitely has come through coaching because, you know, one of the best things people can do is two things: call your friend, call your family member, mm. ask them, "Hey, how you doing?" And then when you feel a certain way, call a friend, call a family member, and tell them how you're doing. Mm. The worst thing people can do is try to bottle, keep things bottled in, and not be there for their for their for their friends or family members. You know, what I mean, it's not. Even, it's not so much about coaching. It's really about finding any sort of support you need and, and making sure that you're not quietly going crazy. Mm, indeed, indeed. Like, I, I hear that. I feel that big time. But yes, going to slightly take this into a different tact. Like, yeah, like, when is your birthday? <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> my, birthday, my birthday is August 13th. August 13th. And like this is the thing. Um, you're gonna be a certain age on your birthday. How old are you gonna be, sir? I'm going to be forty seven years old this year. And with that, what are you going to do on your forty seventh birthday? Okay, so so yeah, I love this segue. This is a great segue. If you go back to remember I mentioned I went to I went to college on athletic scholarship. So I've always been an athlete. Mm-hmm. And as you know, and a lot of us, a lot of older athletes, never want to say we're an ex-athlete. We want to say <laughs> we're still an athlete. So uh-huh. a number of years ago, a number of years ago, I found I found myself getting a little wider um, in the in the stomach area, getting a little slower, um, not catching the eye of as many females as I used to. I've got to got to. Find some way of, of putting together some sort of tradition that keeps me, keeps me in some sort of shape. And I, I love pushing my body physically to the limit and over the limit. I mean, I, I've, done, I've done almost 30 marathons. I love really, and, and, and triathlons. I love mm. doing that. So back in, I believe it was 2008, 2009, excuse me, I decided to start running my age in miles on my birthday. okay look look, this is the thing i yeah i have been known to do a mad run here and there and everything like this but okay so run your on your birthday run your age in miles run my age in miles and when i first started (laughs) started, because as we get older our body gets not as strong Mm. yet this challenge gets tougher each and every year. And when I first started, I was in South China, which is hot and humid. So it was a very, let me say this, this is not a fun thing to do. It's not fun at all. But the, 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 when, I'm, when I'm there, exhausted, tired, those things, so I, can, I keep going, those things really make me feel good. So I usually try to start at midnight. Um, you have some ultra runners who can run 100 miles in one day. I need I need the all twenty four hours to do this. So I'll start at midnight, maybe do a four hour run at midnight. Yeah. Uh, hopefully in about twenty. But let me let me do this with with, with, with um uh, kilometers. Um, hold on a second. So twenty. Oh gosh. So maybe seventy five seventy five uh, kilometers around that. Yeah. Like Roughly. put put it this way, in in miles or kilometers. It's a long <laughs> way. Doesn't no matter how you yeah, cut it, it's a long, it's a long way. way. So like yeah. because okay, look, look, with regards to running, like a marathon, you're twenty six miles. Like yeah, that that's great. So you know what I mean. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like so, you're de- you're getting close to pushing that two marathon ultra like ultra distance 
uh, level right there. Like you're, whew, you're only like, yeah, you're only sort of like five miles off from have, the walking no, marathons no, no, back to back. No, 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 I have what five more years. <laughs> well, well, yeah, five, years yeah, five more years, years. and like this yeah. is the thing, like doing a challenge like that, like I. Uh, There'll be many a person go, that is absolutely bonkers. That is absolutely insane. Uh, no, but that is, you're going into, I don't know if you heard of a ex-Navy SEAL called uh, David Goggins. Goggins, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not even trying to go anywhere close to, to, to his achievements. And, you know, very, ins very inspirational. Very yeah. inspirational. Yeah. Historic, no. Very inspirational. Yeah, like, you know what, most people, like, I would say 90% of people couldn't get anywhere near sort of David Goggins' uh, right. level of achievement because, yeah, that guy is carved My. out of something different. And, uh, like, you know what I mean, that mindset, yeah, you see it very rarely. Uh, documentary, if you haven't seen it yet, I would say watch it. Uh, Last Dance, uh, basically. I, I've, I've used that laugh listen to it while i'm doing some of my longer runs and, and let me say that you know in the environment that i'm in because you know if you're a podcaster i'm quite sure you spend time with podcasters so mm -hmm. i also spend time with people who do a lot of running and you know i am a I, I i say i run I, i'm i'm a runner okay but yep. there are some people who are really really runners so again like i said i'll i'll start at midnight run four hours take like a two, three hour break and keep doing that until I hit, hit the limit. There are some runners in my circle who can do this in, in, in you know, one, one, go, one go around. My wife has run, I think, 300K races. Oh, God so, damn. <laughs> 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 it's like, it's yeah, like, so the environment, the environment that I'm in, it's more of, this is more par for the course, so to speak. Now, now what I'm doing is, is definitely definitely something, but what happens is, if you don't do it, they say, Colin, what happened? Are you doing it this year? So you have to say yes, and quite frankly, it's not fun. It's not fun, but you feel good doing it. And I think about David Goggins. The reason I do it is because, one, it's not fun, and I want to quit, and I don't quit, which helps me to not quit in other aspects of my life. So I think the birthday run helps me to sort of, sort of, uh, Re, uh, re, re tighten up, right? To, yeah. to, to get myself back in that proper mind and, bo mind and body set. Yeah. Yeah. So, how many miles are you running each day to like get yourself in, like, well, keep yourself in shape to do this? Right. Right. I can say more for a week. I think for a week now, I'm up to about. maybe just about 25 miles a week 25 which, miles. right right but if, if you break it down it's, it's not so so much because you may run 10 miles one day mm. and you have you know you're right so it's not so so much the, the challenge has been due to COVID, due to corona right, coronavirus initially you know march april not as much running you go out and jog for a while but not really running running because I can go out and run by myself, but when you run with groups, that's really when you really can do a higher mileage. It's more fun, but groups want meeting. Mm. So, so where I am now in, in May is where I should have been probably a month or so again. And now it's getting hot here. So I think the next, the next few weeks will be very, 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 very interesting training, but I'm looking forward to it because again, it helps sharpen me, it helps sharpen me. And it's something that I'm trying to make sure that continues to be a, uh, a, a a tradition well no no like put it this way uh, i i understand i feel your pain look um put it this way every like more or less every day except uh beginning of this month and today uh i've li like i've run over 15 miles each and every single day so i know really? the, yeah so like uh, there was was it monday i think it was Monday. I actually ran a yeah. I did a marathon distance, but yeah. But like the whole point is like yeah. I understand that sort of degree of pain. Doing forty-seven miles in one day. Oh my god. Yeah. No. <laughs> it's like it's it's mental. You know, it sounds it sounds it sounds like a lot, but if you just know because I've done a lot of, of triathlons, half Ironmans, and one of the things that you know when you get on a bike and you have 90 km to ride 
and you're not really a biker, mm. I have much more pain doing that than I ever did running. And one thing you learn though is every cycle, every time you, you, you cycle, every, whenever you're running, every KM you go, you're getting closer and closer and closer and closer. So you say to yourself, if I'm out here for 10 hours, maybe walking a little bit, as long as, long as I keep going forward, mm. I will get to the end. So when, when I think about starting my business, I know that I'm going to succeed as long as I keep going forward, 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 forward. And that's also a, a strong message for people during this COVID time, right? And, you know, as long as you are making strides every day to improve, you'll get to the end and you'll be fine. So I think me using sports, sports has been a metaphor for my life, man. And, and I, I worry that, again, I worry that when I'm not able to be physical, what am I going to do? My, I think, I'm, you know, I worry I'm going to go crazy because it's such a big part of my life now. Yeah, I know that this is the thing. There will always be something you can do. Put it this way, like, look, before COVID, like, yeah, gym, like, going to the gym, my morning routine would get up, like, do what I need to do, and then yeah. basically I would hit the gym before work, then either catch a train in to work or walk or run, and then carry on with the rest of the day, come back home, rest, do what you need to do. Now it's like I don't have I don't have access to a gym and like yeah I'm expecting a delivery of dumbbells today because well, I, see like, band, I, was, I see your bands over there right yeah you your band behind you yeah got bands so I use bands and like yeah but when my dumbbells arrive soon <laughs> I'll be like I'll lift a little bit of weight but like the reason why I'm investing in the dumbbells is I know like the way it looks. And like gyms might reopen in July, right. but most probably August, and they might yeah. close. Like, why not, why not go back? So, when is your when is your next event? Uh, like running event? I don't do running events. Like, I just simply like I just simply go out run, yeah. okay. run each day, and that's it. Like, um, I was meant to do the Paris Marathon, uh, this year, uh. It's been moved back to September. September. Uh, is it September? No, sorry. October. And at this present time, uh, I'm not too sure if that's going to happen. So right. it looks like it's going to be 2021, possibly. Right. So, but the whole yeah. thing is, I, like, I'm running, like, one, help clear my mind and, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Keep myself going. And yeah, too. It's like my sort of gym surrogate at this present time. So <laughs> right. I have to do something. Now, have, have you have you done a marathon, a proper marathon? No, I haven't. Like I've in my life, I've only run three marathon distances. The first time I did it, I was like, yeah, I did it in like four and a half hours, and I was like, yeah, oh, no what? I was like, I was like, yeah, four and a half hours, great. Yeah. Then the second time, five hours. This time, it like was like six hours but the reason why it was so long this time around is because i've been consistently running a half right. a marathon every single day up until Good that stuff. point so it was like yeah my legs were like going yeah i will we'll carry you to the yeah. distance you want to yeah but don't like don't ask me to like get a clipper speed don't ask me to do this that. it's like going, yeah if you want that give me a week's rest and like then come back to the distance and then we'll give you something else. But yeah. yeah. But I, I wish I wish you luck in that first marathon because that first when, when you cross that finish line, well, when you get through the last six miles, last 10K, mm. when you really feel that burn, <laughs> the, the pride you feel once you cross, it's funny because I guarantee you're gonna feel like, yes, I've done this, I'm never gonna do it again in my life. Mm. And, then, and then two days later, you're going to say, I'm going to sign up for the next one. <laughs> uh, I, wish you, I wish you luck on that, man, because that is, that is a tremendous accomplishment. And you motivate your family and friends also. Yeah. Like the thing what I think is going to slightly mess with me, and like I've known it, like I know this when I've done 10K runs and stuff like this, or like we have a charity over here called Park Run. And like they used to, like, well, they, when they come, everyone comes back, they did Park Runs, like 5K. Right. each and every Saturday morning. So once, like, and you're just like, all oh, right. You get caught, I get caught up with, like, the sort of 
the crowd running. There's like it's like a little yappy dog inside me. Like, okay, everyone's running. Come on. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Come on. Come on. Yes, we can do this. And like, yeah. By the time I sort of get halfway through this run, because I'm going at a a, a much more accelerated pace. Yeah. Like, it's like depending on the track, it's like I'm halfway through. Like, I, why, why did you do this? It's like I'm, why are you putting your foot off through it? And I was like, yeah. You're running with everyone. And it's like, okay, let's do it. I'm like, okay. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's funny because one of the first things, you, you know, because you got to learn how to race. One of the first things you learn is run at your own pace. Do not run with the crowd. But you always learn that because <laughs> you try to do it the opposite way. And I'll tell you, my first 5K was in Washington, D.C. It was um, the student, the Susan K. Uh, uh, Coleman. It was for breast cancer. Her mother mm. had breast cancer. So my whole family ran the race. Now, I remember... I was about 23, 24, in great shape. That gun went off, pow! <laughs> this older black gentleman, I'll never forget this, older black gentleman said, hey, young man, you may want to slow down a little bit. My mom was like, man, you old man. You got you old man talking about old guy talking about old guy. Dude, dude, about, about, gosh, about 3K in, I was dead, right? Walking, walking, walking who comes running by me? Yep. Hey, hey, young man. <laughs> Just like, same old man. I'm like, wow. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's 5K. And I, always, I, remember, I always remember that because that's five, my first 5K. I felt like it almost killed me. I mean, I knew it, it was tough, man. So, yeah, it, that was a long time ago. But, yeah, you got to learn how to – you got to learn the rules of racing, man, how to, how to, you know, run at your own pace and don't let those – okay, run at your own pace. And sometimes you're lucky enough to have a very – Nice image in front of you. Yeah, you mean like, yeah, looking out at sea where dolphins come jumping in and yeah, 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 it was like we we're unofficially racing each other, if you get what I mean. Like, yeah, yeah. he he went past me, and like it was like, yeah, he was just ahead of me. I was like, okay, yeah. Then he had to stop, and I went past him, and like it was just ahead of him, and like it was like going back, forth, back, forth, back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, yeah. The, the yeah, last, I, I was gonna say, the last two hundred meters, like yeah, it like it was like yeah, it turned from. No, 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 to like, okay, full on, like running, full speed. <laughs> there was this other guy, this tall, like, tall guy, toy guy, and like he, like, he got drawn into it as well, and he just went, boom, he left us for dust, and there was just the two of us. <laughs> I, run, I like, any fool what got in our way that time would have just been run over. That's like, run over. <laughs> someone like, going, my kidney. And I was like, yeah, forget you. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> Times, man, those are fun times. You know, the very big on ego. I, I got two quick stories here, right? Yeah. The first one in races, you find a lot of times that people go back and forth. You may stop and get some water, somebody pass you up. Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. But after the race, and even if you sprint at the end, after the race, you always find friends say, Hey, good job, good job. Yeah. And it helps people to bond there. And I don't know if this is because I'm black or because I'm a foreigner, but a lot of times in China, if you go to a track, and running around a track, it's sort of like people people want to be able to run faster than a black guy. You know what you're saying, right? So <laughs> they're running, and they see me past them. Next thing you know, the pace gets faster, right? <laughs> and they want to either keep up with me, keep up, keep up, keep up, or try to pass me up, man. It's very funny because I don't know if it's because they don't want a foreigner or they want to have the pride to say, you know what, I'm running yeah. faster than a black guy. Right? <laughs> yeah. So it's always, yeah, it's always very fun, man. I, I enjoy, I enjoy, um, yeah, I, I enjoy the the camaraderie and the stories that running, running definitely gives you. You, you had a great story yourself, man. So I, I enjoy the running stories. I absolutely, absolutely. Oh, oh wow, we're on an hour and forty five minutes. Like, yeah, like, yeah. If you could give people like how they can find you like website right. social media that'll be great that'll be outstanding how yeah so you? yeah so, so let me just say www everybody knows that o-l-i-g-y-e.com oligay.com mm -hmm. if you go there you will find you'll be able to navigate 
to all my information. I do have Facebook, I do have Instagram, I do have Twitter, or Twitter, like you guys say, but... That's my terrible British accent. Uh, I've been in China for the last 12 years, so when Facebook came out, uh, social, me social media, we really don't have that much in here in China. So I just started using social media a few years ago. I, I did my first tweet, I want to say last December. Okay. My first Instagram, I want to say last December also. Facebook, <laughs> I want to on longer. So if you navigate to my website, O-L-I-G-Y-E.com, you can then navigate to find me. And again, so there are two things that, that, that are in, in my space. Um, one is life coaching. And you can find information on how to, how to get a hold of me for life coaching. The yeah. other side, is the is the blockchain uh educational platform which is not on that site but we're building that out now and you can still navigate to that through there but that, that, that part's not ready yet so not. go to the website and you can also on the website get access to those 30 for 30 uh coaching episodes um they're they're 100 free go, go to the website also information for the covid covid 40 for 40 where we want all of your listeners to Embrace life coaching, take a stab at life coaching, go to our website and register for a free life coaching session. We're not selling you anything. We're not going to close the call saying you want to buy anything. No, we're going to close the call, giving you, giving, helping you guide you through making, improving your life. So check out the website. We have all the information there. Ah, superb, superb. What I'll do, I'll also put that information in the show notes and the description. So right. yes, everyone go out there and find them. Ah, uh, yeah, I've got to say thank you, Colin. Like, yeah, this has yeah. been very entertaining. And yeah, I'll definitely get you on again, like especially when your blockchain site's up and running proper. We can talk right. about that. And yeah, go into a little bit more detail. But yes, once again, thank you, sir. Excellent having you on here. Uh, I'd like to say thank you uh, to one and all, uh, to all my friends and life warriors out there. Ah, have an excellent day. Stay well, stay safe, be excellent, be fantastic, be all the positive bees you can be in this world and more. Ah, thank you very much for watching the Day In Day Out podcast and have a great day. Peace. <laughs>